The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. It's not often that an individual is able to pair two lifelong passions into one career, or two careers, or even seamlessly transition from excellence at one craft to the ease and excellence of a second. But that's exactly where we find James Hinchcliffe today. Not only was he a pro at open wheel racing throughout a career that took him around the track at Indy, as well as on the street circuits of North America, he's also a pro on an open microphone. Hinch, as he's known, is one heck of a cars and culture talent. On the track, he's excelled at speeds over 200 miles per hour with 161 race starts in an 11-year career. He won six times, most famously known for coming back after a life-threatening crash during practice for the 2015 Indy 500. Montreal, Ontario's James Hinchcliffe was taken to hospital and underwent emergency surgery on his upper left thigh following a crash during an Indianapolis 500 practice run today. Hinchcliffe had just posted a lap speed of 221 miles per hour when an apparent failure to his front right suspension sent him slamming into the wall on corner three. After the crash, the four-time IndyCar winner was awake when taken by ambulance to local hospital. All he did was take the pole at the race the next year. Off the track, the kid who wanted to be a journalist has easily transitioned to a career as a racing analyst for NBC Sports, as well as a show called Off Track with Hinch and Rossi, a Sirius XM podcast with fellow racer and friend Alexander Rossi. This is Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. The kid who always wanted to do both, journalism and racing, has done and is doing both. And what a ride. His likable personality has led him to the microphone at some of the biggest races in the country, with the perspective of having gone wheel to wheel with some of the biggest names in the country. Today, as we head toward another running of the Indy 500 next month, he gives us his take on cars, racing, and broadcast culture. We talk about the growth of racing in America, the influence of Formula One, and his own personal goals and ambitions for the next chapter of his young life. We also talk about being a runner-up on Dancing with the Stars growing up with big dreams in a big American racing world, and some of his heroes. James Hinchcliffe on the other side of the microphone today, a candid talk from a likable Canadian, today on Cars and Culture. Hi, I'm James Hinchcliffe, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. What a pleasure to have two Canadians on the program for a change. You know, it's been a long time, James. It was a fellow named Ed Robertson, who I'm sure you if you haven't met him, you certainly have met his music at the Bare Naked Ladies. But yep. I mean, Canadians on Sirius XM radio, we can never go wrong, right? Couldn't agree more. I think it's I think it's one of the best places to find us. <laughs> exactly. And you're very comfortable behind the microphone, um, which is uh, which is a a welcome thing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the program uh, after after we learn a little bit more about you. So. Sure. Let's start with your racing career. You started kart racing at nine years old in Canada. What was the point early on when you were like, this, I want to do this? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I always wanted to do it just to do it. You know, I, I had a, a huge uh, love for motorsports from a young age. My dad was a huge influence on me in that sense. And long before I ever had a go-kart, I was just a huge fan of the sport. So uh, I always wanted to give it a try, but I'd be lying if I said that, you know, from the age of nine, I really had aspirations of doing it professionally because at that age, even then I knew that's not a real job. That's not something people actually get to do. You know, it was not really on my radar. It was a hobby. It was fun. And it probably wasn't until I was about 14 that, uh, you know, my dad and I started really kind of focusing on trying to make it more of a thing and, and, and trying to take a stab at, at having a career in it. Your family was totally supportive of the idea. Yeah, yeah, huge. I mean, I don't think anybody could make it in this sport or really any sport without a massive family support from a young age. It's, uh, you know, it's tough for kids in the single digits to really blaze their own path alone. So uh, family support, I think, is is huge in, in any athlete's story. 
Canadian racers are few and far between, especially ones who rise to the top. But did you have Canadian heroes who you emulated or were they global heroes or were they American or where were they from? Yeah, I mean, my my racing heroes were definitely all Canadians. I, I definitely gravitated towards, you know, the Paul Tracy's and before that Jacques Villeneuve's and uh, and my real hero, though, the one to use your word to try to emulate was Greg Moore. Uh, yeah, he Greg. was kind of the biggest influence on me as a young driver and uh you know losing him was a a very big shock to not just the racing world but to this 12 year old kid that was racing carts at the time you know wanting to be that guy uh so it was uh it was it was real tough when when greg passed but he was kind of my number one guy was it harder because you were canadian i think it was just i think he was my I think he was partly my hero because I was Canadian and so was he. And then it's, I think it's hard when you lose your hero, you know, when you're that age and you are, you know, idolizing this, this person and wanting to sort of replicate their career and their life. And then all of a sudden they lose their life doing this thing at that age, it can be a little bit jarring and, you know, you don't really understand all of it. You know, racing can be dangerous or whatever, but, uh, it sort of hits you a little bit different in that moment. And I give my parents a lot of credit because at that point, you know, my parents were pretty affected by it as well. And it would have been easy for them at 12 years old to be like, okay, here's uh, a tennis racket. We're taking the go-kart away. And what would I have said? You know, I really had no rebuttal at that point. Um, but they didn't, they let me decide if it was still something I was comfortable doing. And I decided that it was, and that Greg wouldn't wanted wouldn't have wanted me to have stopped because of him, sort of thing, and uh, and away we went. And if you weren't going to be a racer, what were you comfortable doing, or what did you want to do? It's, I mean, this. I think like a lot of people, that answer would have been different at different phases of my life. But uh, once I was old enough to have some sense of the world, I honestly, I just, I loved racing so much. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to write for Autosport magazine. That was kind of my dream. You know, it was this, we this weekly racing mag uh, produced out of England and, or published out of England. And we, we subscribed to it, but just because of the way it worked, we got our copy like a month late every week, right? We were just a month behind. <laughs> and even though I already knew everything that had happened and, you know, I, I'd already, watch the races that they're previewing and all the rest of it. I still read that, that thing cover to cover. And I always thought, man, it'd be so cool to get to travel to all the races and just kind of write about motorsports and, and cars and races and drivers and stuff. So I don't know. I feel like even if I wasn't driving, I'd still somehow be involved in the sport. Yeah. Amazing. So I just referenced it off the top. You do a podcast on Sirius XM with Alexander Rossi called off track with Hinch and Rossi which is a, a bit of a dream then, or maybe it's a bit of, if you couldn't go racing, you'd be a journalist. And now you went racing and you are a journalist. <laughs> I mean, the term journalist is probably a little bit strong for I'll what give we you do on off track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I honestly off, off track's a great, it's a, it, it is a great situation because not only is it still very much tied into motorsports and, uh, you know, a cool way to get to do it. I get to do it with one of my best friends and, um, you know, former competitors and things like that. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool setup. And we've, we just, I think we found out or realized we've been doing it for almost five years now, which is crazy to think. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really picked up some momentum and we've got a nice, nice little fan base for it. So it's been a lot of fun. Your conversation includes topics that you'd expect recent race results, drivers, driver strategy courses, but you also talk about whether to unpack your suitcase in a hotel <laughs> You discuss <laughs> urinal etiquette and the judgment Alex makes when he walks into an Apple store. You bring your mm -hmm. producer into the conversation, too. With more than 200 episodes under your belt, it kind of feels like a conversation at a bar or at a home. Is that meant to be the vibe? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. It's that's that's why I don't like necessarily the the journalistic angle because I feel like that is giving us too much credit because it is just kind of three friends talking about. Yes, we are involved in motorsports, so we're clearly going to cover that. We're focused mainly on on IndyCar, but we certainly touch on Formula One, NASCAR, sports cars, whatever. But we also go off track sometimes, and you know, we go off piste, so to speak, and just talk about you know the the daily the daily uh, grind and the gripes of your you know the the common person, 
And, uh, you know, we get made fun of for being a quasi travel podcast because we have a lot of stories of travel because we all do that quite a bit for our work. And uh, yeah, I mean, things like your urinal etiquette or that's an important thing that people need to know about. And so that's <laughs> that's what we cover. We cover it all. Who gets the pole position among you and Rossi when it comes to asking the first question? Who leads? Oh, man, I we sort of just whoever whoever feels more energetic that day will let kick off the show. There's no real rhyme or reason to how we do it or why we do it, because, again, it's kind of just more like a, a bit of a conversation. It's amazing. Early in your career, you found yourself behind a microphone or in front of a TV camera. It really came easily for you back to that other passion. Right now, this media stuff is not rocket surgery, but how and why did that happen? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I, I was very lucky that early in my career, I had this, this opportunity to actually do some broadcasting for the international champ car feed um, uh, when I was running the Atlantic series. And yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I just, I've been such a fan of the sport for so long. I think any kind of, you know, public speaking type thing, everybody's terrified of public speaking and, and talking in front of crowds, whatever. What was fun about that opportunity is you don't really recognize that you're talking in front of a crowd because it's two people in a booth and a microphone. Sure. And sometimes your brain disconnects that that microphone might be going off to 170 countries around the world. And you can kind of <laughs> just be a little more relaxed than if you're actually in a room of people. And then the other thing I always think when it comes to any kind of public speaking or, or being on the spot in that sense is as long as you know what you're talking about, I think you're going to be okay. And I knew racing. I know racing. That's that's what I've always, you know, always followed, always been passionate about. And so that opportunity with, you know, Jeremy Shaw when I was younger, before I was able to make a career out of driving, was was really kind of uh, formative in a sense because it really gave me an appetite for maybe pursuing that when I did hang up the helmet. Well, and now you're in your second full season with NBC Sports, providing uh, race time analysis for IndyCar, and. It, that broadcasting element really seems to be, forgive me, seems to be really your lane now. You're so comfortable in front of the camera and obviously here in front of the microphone. Did you do any broadcast training at all or was it simply just letting loose on the viewer? Yeah, I just I just blame my dad. I think my dad was this super outgoing, kind of gregarious guy. And, and I think I just inherited some of that from him because... Um, I never had any training. I, I would have loved some, to be honest, you know, one of, one of my big, uh, big concerns going into this, this NBC, uh, position was like, you know, you're going to be on network TV over a dozen times a year. I assumed there was going to be a lot of preparation, maybe some seminars, some do's and don'ts, a handbook of some kind. There's nothing, <laughs> man. There's nothing. It is higher. You can Just give you a microphone it. and it's it's a sink or swim kind of situation, you know, and, and they really, and, and on one hand, it's great. Cause they give you a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility and, and it's kind of, you can make whatever you need to make your own, your own. But at the same time, the buck stops with you. You kind of a one man show in that respect, you're responsible for your own program. And, and if it's not up to par, then they'll look elsewhere. So it's, it is kind of an interesting situation. It's, it's, competitive in the sense that you're, com you're competing with yourself to kind of always be better. You know, I, I work with a great group at NBC and, uh, you know, in the booth with Lee and Townsend and uh, those guys are true professionals and there's no kind of competition within that group. It's com competition with yourself to always be better, bring a different perspective, bring something else to the broadcast. And uh, I, I kind of enjoy and, and kind of revel in that sense of it. And live television is fun. You know, it, it's kind of got a little bit of that adrenaline rush that you get in, in in sport or competition. It's different than a, a scripted show or something recorded where if you make a mistake or something, you can just go back and redo it. Uh, and we have problems thrown at us, whether it's a technical issue or some weird and wild thing that happens in a race. You got to think on your feet. And I kind of like that challenge as well. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's been a really fun transition. Is it terrifying at times for you? It was at the beginning for sure. And, you know, there are definitely times where you feel the gravity of what you're doing. Certainly calling any Indy 500 is huge. You know, it's the biggest race in the world and it's your responsibility to share that with the millions of people watching around the world. And so you, you feel moments like that, certainly. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a great group that I work with and I really enjoy what I'm doing. So uh, it's, it's fun to go to work every weekend. 
Okay, but you're no stranger to the camera. If I say Foxtrot, Tango, Viennese, <laughs> Waltz, they're not characters in a Top Gun Maverick film. They're some of the dance moves you performed on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bit of a different deal. That How way. was that, James? That was a remarkable experience. Um, it was that was far more terrifying than uh, than broadcasting any car races. I can tell you that. And being on camera in in that you know sort of circumstance is a lot different than what I did what I'd been used to or anything I'd been comfortable doing beforehand. So it was a big it was a big learning experience. You know, it was really teaching you to kind of get outside the box a little bit, get outside your comfort zone, and. Uh, take risks, even though people are watching, you know, do something kind of crazy. Uh, and honestly, it was, it was the experience of a lifetime. I mean, so few people get the opportunity to do something like that. And I don't think a younger version of me would have agreed to do it. I think I would have been, you know, too afraid to look stupid on camera or something like that. But uh, I was talked into it and I'm very glad that I was I had a great experience it's a lot of work. You have a whole new respect for, you know, the art of dance and and the people that do that professionally. And uh, I met some great people and some lifelong friends out of it. So it was uh, it was a really, really great experience. It was 2016, correct? Correct. What did your fellow racers have to say about your time on the show? Well, it's it's funny because, as you can imagine, uh, they were all lined up ready to to take their respective jabs at me. And. I had a couple of them come up to me the next. So we had the way the season of the show panned out, we had one race left in the IndyCar season after the first show. So basically did our first show on a Monday. We raced that following weekend and then the season was done. So I kind of had only one opportunity. They had one opportunity to watch me and then see me the next week to make fun of me. And uh, that first week on the show, we tied for first place you know on the on the night and it went pretty well and so when i got to the track you know a couple of days later a couple of my friends there were like look i gotta be honest with you man i had a laundry list of things i was gonna say to you but you actually did way better than we were <laughs> expecting so like i mean credit to you we're not gonna say anything because that was actually really impressive <laughs> wow but you finished second and not only second but you finished second to a particular individual elio yes well, I mean, he wasn't on the same season, so he won his season, uh, which he loves to remind me. I, yeah, but right. <laughs> I, yeah, so yeah, I, I finished second to an Olympic gold medal winning gymnast, which for a guy that sits for a living, I thought was pretty, pretty good, <laughs> all things considered. But yeah, Elio definitely likes to remind me that that he got a mirror ball trophy and that I came second. So good. Your final <laughs> freestyle dance performance was pretty personal. Uh, there was uh, also your voiceover at the beginning of the dance and at the end talking about your accident at Indianapolis, which I'm going to ask you about in a second. But was that dance a particularly cathartic experience for you? Yeah, it was really fun to create it. And I think one of the huge um, huge lessons, I think, that I took out of that whole experience was, um, you know, learning how much fun creating can be. I'm not I'm not really the artistic type necessarily, uh, but my partner, Sharna Burgess, uh, was an incredible creator and choreographer and storyteller. And it was really fun getting to work with her on that on that dance in particular because it was, you know, personal to me. All the other ones were we got a style of of dance and a song and okay, let's go figure it out. Uh, but this one we really got to, you know, work on together and and sort of tell a little bit of the story of the accident and then my recovery and and everything like that. So I think it was in a way uh, a little bit cathartic and also just, it was just a really fun experience kind of creating something like that. Yeah. Wonderful. So let's talk about that accident because quite famously you were severely injured in 2015 on a practice lap at the Indianapolis 500. Of course uh, the Indy 500 coming up here shortly again, for those who don't know the story, your suspension failed on your car. You were sent into the wall at approximately 220 miles per hour, a piece of the car severed the artery in your leg and you woke up in a hospital post-surgery unable to speak you had a ventilator how often do you think about that day i mean in some respects i think about it every day 
Mm -hmm. um, because there are things that going through an experience like that changes in you as a person. And so, yeah, I mean, there are, there are life lessons, I think, learned over that sort of four month journey from the accident to getting back into a race car that I quite literally think about or consider or affect my day every single day. Um, but it was all personal. That's, that's what was fascinating is, you know, a lot of people would ask, you know, did, did, did the accident change you? And professionally, the answer is no. I mean, I was very willing to get, in fact, quite eager to get back into a race car despite yep. everything. Once I got back racing, I took the same risks. I did the same things, you know, the, the same challenges, uh, still, still were something that I, I really enjoyed and, uh, you know, relished in being in that environment. But personally, it changed me quite a bit because, again, it, it makes you really start to appreciate certain things in life, certain people in life. Um, you stop taking little things for granted that I think maybe a lot of people do. Certainly, I was guilty of doing beforehand. And uh, so, yeah, it was it was in a lot of ways. And I've said this before. It was in a lot of ways. It was the best thing that happened to me because it really did give me a whole new perspective on life. And, uh, and it's one that I'm, I'm incredibly thankful, you know, to have now. And just a year later, you're back at Indianapolis. You're not only back racing, but you're in the pole position for the race, not just any race, the hundredth running of the Indy 500. Can you take me inside your helmet as the 2016 Indy 500 is about to go off? Do you remember what that felt like and what you were thinking? Yeah. I mean, that was such a special time, you know, to go back to the track where, you know, I nearly lost my life one year later and, you know, qualify first for the hundredth running of the greatest spectacle in racing. There's a lot of things that made that kind of a, a storybook situation. And, you know, the, the thing that people have to remember is, you know, a race team is like a big family. And even though I was the one that got hurt in the car, you know, that whole team, felt like they lost a brother, you know, they, they all went through that and there was, there was emotional damage and scarring to a, a lot of members of that team, just kind of living through that experience together. And it was so cool going back a year later, because a lot of the group was the same. We had a lot of the same people on the car and it was kind of the same pretty tight knit group that went back to the track and qualifying pole at Indy is always a special thing for the hundredth makes it extra special. And considering what had happened the year before, you know, indescribably special, and so, yeah, we, we are coming to race day and, and, uh, you know, before the start of the race, it's funny. I felt this, it was almost like a pressure, um, a responsibility is probably a better way to put it because, you know, the, one of the coolest things at Indy is that first pace lap where the cars are lined up three by three and you wave to the crowd. It's the first time you do a lap of the track with the place completely full of people, you know, you do hundreds, maybe a thousand laps over the course of the month of May before the race starts. But it's the first time that there's actually people in every grandstand and you really get to kind of absorb the enormity of that event. And because it was the 100th running of the race, it was sort of an extra special one. It was the first time the race had been sold out in 20 years or something like that. And so I thought to myself, you know, like, the picture of this pace lap is probably going to be one that shared a lot for a long time. And I felt a responsibility as the guy in first to make sure that all the cars were lined up right. And then that picture looked good because I knew we were going to be using it for a while. And uh, it's funny how much I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So for that first lap, that's all I could think of was just kind of making us check into my mirrors, trying to, not that I could do anything about the guy right, behind me, but I'm up. trying to just like eyeball it. Yeah. Make sure everybody's doing their job. Uh, but then, you know, like, like any race, I mean, once the green flag drops, you switch into this mode where nothing else is relevant. Nothing else matters. You think about nothing else. And it's just about racing. How hard is that race from a physical perspective, from a mental perspective, from a spiritual perspective? Yeah, I think, I think the mental perspective is what really, really separates Indianapolis. Um, the, the physicality of the race as a racetrack itself, it's on the lower end of physicality where it becomes challenging is, is the duration, right? It's almost twice the length of any other race that we do. So it gets physical in the sense that you just, you just get tired from driving that, you know, for that long, you get dehydrated, you know, you can get very hot in the car, depending on what the weather is on a given day. But like I said, the, the mental side of it is the hardest part. I mean, staying that Being focused. sharp, 
that focus for three, three and a half, sometimes four hours, depending on how the race plays out, you know, in, in an environment where, you know, you're traveling over a football field a second. That's how fast mm. you're going. And so if you miss a turning point by one tenth of a second, I mean, that's a 10 yard difference, right? And you're probably driving around at a track where the margin for error is maybe four or five feet, maybe. And so you have to maintain that level of focus for that amount of time while everything's constantly changing around you. You know, the weather conditions change, whether you're at the front of the pack, in the middle of the pack, at the back of the pack, is at the beginning of a stint with new tires and full fuel or the end of a stint with worn tires and low fuel, everything just sort of evolves on the fly and being able to keep up with that mentally, what do you have to do differently? You're almost reverse engineering the race from lap 200 backwards. Okay. I know that at lap 200, I want to be the first person across the line. So where do I have to be on lap 199? Where do I have to be on lap 198? You kind of work your way back all while traveling, you know, almost 400 kilometers an hour, you know, hmm. 220 miles an hour. So it's it mentally as a, as a exercise, as an exercise, it's one of the most challenging things I think in sports. Wow. And how do you prepare for something like that? I mean, how do you prepare for the fact that at lap 127, that you might be getting mentally fatigued or that maybe there's been a long run without a lot of cautions. So you are running continually. I mean, how to just sharpening in, focusing in, right. How, keeping that mental stability. How's that even possible? It's, it's challenging because it's also not something you can really practice very right. easily. You know, we, we don't get to go testing in IndyCar very often. I think you're allowed three test days over the course of an entire year. So, you know, I, I kind of like uh, imagine a, a hockey team only gets to skate together for three days between, you know, the end of the playoffs one year and the start of the new season the next. It's just unheard of. And it's not even like you can go individually to a rink and practice a certain skill set. If there's something you want to work on, do drills, whatever. We don't get to sit in a race car more than three times over the course of the year. So it's uh, outside of race events. So it's it's a it's a huge challenge. You can't just go practice driving for three and a half straight hours to get your mind and your body used to that. So you have to find alternate ways of sort of recreating that sort of stress. And a lot of that comes out of physical training. So you do, you know, a particularly long workout and throw in a lot of mental exercises, cognitive drills throughout that to kind of teach your mind to stay sharp, even as your body starts to fatigue. Uh, and you do everything you can to keep your body in a position where it's not really fatiguing as much, you know, you build up that stamina and that strength to, uh, like I said, we train for the other 16 races of the, of the year that are about an hour and 45 to two hours long. And then all of a sudden you've got this one that could be anywhere from three to four hours long. It is a completely different beast. Well, and then you go from Indianapolis and at least in the current schedule, the schedule that's, that's been in place, you just race the following weekend in Detroit. I mean, get right back on the track and get going. Yeah. So, and and it couldn't be downtime. more different. Right. No. And then that's the thing too. I mean, Indianapolis 500 is so unique because it's a, it's a two week event, right? Most races, we show up on a Thursday set up, we're on track Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we go home. Uh, Indianapolis, you show up, you do almost a week of practice. There's a full weekend of qualifying. Then you have another couple of days of events and media and all the tradition and, and pop and circumstance. That's the 500. Then you get another practice day and then you go and do the race and it's, it's two weeks and it's exhausting. It's exhausting because you're in the car so much. It's exhausting because of all the ancillary stuff you have to do because it's the Indy 500. And what everybody would love after Indy is a week off. And we've had it once in like 20 years. And so, uh, and it was great. And everybody was hoping that was going to be, you know, the, the new de facto schedule, but not the case. And so you go from spending two weeks driving around this massive two and a half mile oval. That's very smooth. All the facilities are great. Uh, 220 to 230 miles an hour all day. And then a week later, we're on the streets of Detroit where, you know, a street circuit. So it's narrow, it's bumpy, it's slow, it's tight, it's twisty. And your whole brain just has to sort of recalibrate and be like, okay, we're done with that indie stuff. Now we got to get back to focusing on how to do the rest of this stuff. Wow. You walked away in December of 21 after 11 years in IndyCar. Why did you decide that that was the time? Why was it the time? 
it was it was a combination of things you know the, it was one of those perfect storm situations where uh, a few things you know personally a few things professionally all sort of came together at one particular moment and it would have been really easy for me to sit there and think well hey this is a little bit earlier than you know when i was when I first started, when I was 24 and got my first ride in IndyCar, it was maybe a little bit earlier than I thought I would stop. But a lot happened in that 11 years. And uh, I think in my in my heart, I could have thought about, you know, grinding it out for another year or two. And then that was probably going to be it either way. Um but my head, when I sort of took emotion out of it and really just looked at the whole situation from 30,000 feet, I decided that this was the right time. I, I was, I had kind of been given all these signals and signs. And like I said, all these things aligning. And I was like, okay, man, this is sort of, I think the universe saying this is the right time to, to make this call. And it was a tough one. It was not an easy call to make, but you know, you live with that through the off season because your off season is not a ton different. And then you get to that first race and that's when it was really going to hit you, whether or not it was the right decision. And I remember standing in St. Pete last year, 22, um, during, you know, qualifying on Saturday and thinking to myself, there are things that I miss. There's a lot that I don't, and, and I'm standing in the right spot for me right now. So like I said, it was, it was a lot of different things kind of all coming together at one time, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely the right move. And how, ironic coincidental that you're standing there in the first race at St. Pete, which was your first Indy series win occurred in St. Pete makes it even likely a little more challenging or, or a lot to digest at that time. Anyway, James. Yeah. I mean, that's, that was always one of my favorite events. Uh, my entire career, I looked forward to that race and, you know, obviously with some incredible memories there from, from the win in 2013. And I, uh, you're right. I mean, it's, it's almost, it was almost a great test because that was one of the ones that I looked forward to the most every year. And if I was going to miss one and really itch to be back in the car, that was going to be it. Uh, so again, that was just further, further proof that we were in the right spot and, and doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, what I'm doing now is something that I really enjoy and hopefully I can have an 11 plus year career doing this. And, you know, crazy to think that one person could be lucky enough to have even the racing career that I had, never mind this opportunity to still be involved and, and doing what I'm doing now. So I'm just trying to enjoy every minute of it. But drivers have a shelf life and probably more, more so than other athletes, a little hard to be Tom Brady in the racing world. Uh, but you know, Fernando Alonso might come closest, I, I suppose at this point, do you marvel at drivers who are able to stay well into their thirties in some cases over history into their forties? 50s <laughs> for sure i mean to to uh, i i understand the motivation to want to do it and the passion to want to do it but to still be competitive at that at that stage is what's super impressive so guys like fernando you know what he's doing lewis is not getting any younger you know yep. and and he's obviously got a, a boatload of championships uh to his name but there's still one more i know that he wants uh and his level is still very impressive I look at Scott Dixon and IndyCar, you know, that is arguably, I honestly, I don't even think there's much of an argument. I think you could pretty much say definitively the greatest driver of our generation, uh, you know, when he's admired by guys like Mario Andretti, you know, that it's a pretty special person and, you know, Scott's in his forties and still competitive, uh, you know, Will Power won the championship last year. He's in his forties. So there's a few of these drivers that are finding ways to still be fast and still win races and still win championships. When you have this, this slew of young talent coming in, you know, if all these drivers that have, that are under 30, this, you know, this year, uh, it's a significant part of the field and it's drivers that have already won races and have already competed for, you know, wins, podiums, and five hundreds, championships, whatever it is. So yeah, you you have to you have to admire and uh and and really respect some of the drivers that that are doing it, like you say, into their 40s. And Jimmy Johnson, we've had him on the program last year. He tried to really cross over and give it a go, found it incredibly difficult. It is hard to go from these um from certain elements of racing to other elements, right? Absolutely. I mean, there are so many, there are so many 
things that are different between the different styles of motorsports. And I think I think people that are involved in the sport, they struggle to sort of see that. It's it's almost like saying that hockey and golf are basically the same because you have a stick like thing and you swing it and hit a object a distance. Like that's about as similar as as stock cars are to open wheel cars. <laughs> And, and we've seen it the other way too. You know, we've seen very talented IndyCar drivers try to go to stock car racing and really struggle. And it takes a long time to, to get up to speed if they get there at all. Um, I think of Sam Hornish, I think of Dario Franchitti, I think of AJ Allmendinger, uh, you know, while Pablo Montoya, a lot of drivers have gone that way. Jimmy, I give Jimmy so much credit, so much credit for after the massive like marathon of a career that he had in NASCAR and all the success that he had that he wanted to undertake this incredible challenge of trying to learn a completely different discipline. I it's, it's akin to MJ taking up baseball. It really is. Um, and that wasn't, a, that, that didn't go great for MJ. You know, it's, it's very tough when you're, when you're competing against a group of highly, highly tuned athletes who have done just this one thing their entire life. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. And so, you know, Jimmy had a couple races that were absolutely brilliant and, and showed why he's been so successful as a professional driver. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it's, it's a huge ass to switch disciplines like that, especially, you know, at the, at the time in his life that he did. Let's talk a little bit about F1 planting its flag deep in the U S market, Miami, Austin, Vegas, obviously to come. There's even been mention of a race in New York city. What do you think F1's presence in the U.S. does to viewership and attendance of either IndyCar or NASCAR? I'm I'm a firm believer that that rising tides lift all ships, you know, and I don't see the the popularity of Formula One increasing in the U.S. as a detrimental thing to IndyCar racing or NASCAR racing. Uh, they have a very different product in a lot of ways. They only have three races in the country compared to, you know, 17, well, 16 uh, in, in the States and one in Canada for IndyCar and 36, 38, whatever it is for, for cup, at least uh, all in the States. So I think attendance at those races is always going to be strong because you don't have 20 to 30 races to choose from. You have three. And so if you want to catch one of those races, it's going to be one of those three. And so attendance is big. Uh, TV viewership, it's, it's comparable to, uh, IndyCar at the moment and still behind NASCAR. So NASCAR is still the most popular motorsport in the U S. Um, but what I see is because of the Netflix show, it has drawn a lot of new fans to motorsports in general. And I think that these new fans will potentially see that, okay, I've enjoyed F1. I've learned about F1. I've enjoyed that, but oh yeah, there's also these other series, these other series that run in the U S potentially in my backyard, in my hometown that if I like F1, maybe I'll like this too. And so that's why I don't really see it as a bad thing. I think, I think racing fans are racing fans. You could have your preferred series, but I mean, look, obviously my heart and, and passion has always been IndyCar. I watched Talladega yesterday. I'm I'm going to watch Azerbaijan next weekend. You know, I, I watch motorsports. I'm a, I'm a fan of racing. You're a racing fan. And right. so I think, right. So I think as you get more fans into the, to the sport in any one series, they'll, they will, if they're true fans of the sport, will, you know, start to diversify and, and see some of the other sports out there. Last year was so close. Will Power edging out. Joseph Newgarden for the IndyCar Championship. How does 2023 shake out? Is it Marcus Erickson's year? Is it Pato Award? Um, who's left standing at the end of 23? Yeah, it's that's a that's a very very tough question. You know, I mean, I can tell you today who's going to win the F1 Championship. We've both had three races, <laughs> we, you know, IndyCar and, and F1. Right. But I can I can I would bet a lot of things on <laughs> who would win the F1 Championship this year. I, I wouldn't bet 10 bucks on who's going to take the IndyCar crown. Uh, it's just, it's so up in the air. You've had, you know, the last 10 championships have been won between two teams, uh, which makes it seem a little more F1-esque in that sense. But you've always had uh, members from other teams in the mix. And you've had, you know, Ganassi has four full-time cars. Penske's got three full-time cars. So right there, you're looking at seven entrants. Andretti's 
had a bit of a resurgence this year. It seems like they had a strong off season for full-time entries there. McLaren has come on board. They've expanded to a third car. They've hired a new driver with several race wins and an Indy 500 under his belt uh, and Alexander Rossi. So that organization has definitely been boosted by the addition of him in the seven car. So you have already, you know, that's like, that's like 12 cars right there that, uh, that are all race winning potential. And that's not, you know, that that's discounting the kind of one-off races where someone could just call strategy, right. Or have a particular setup on a given day that just works well. So it's, it's tough. I mean, Will won it last year on a on a bet of consistency. You know, he had one win, but a lot of top fives and a lot of top tens. Joseph was the kind of the roller coaster season with five wins, but a few DNFs and just came up short. So there are several routes to a championship in IndyCar and a lot of different drivers, a lot of different kind of on track personalities. It's it's tough to predict who's going to come out on top. Yeah, always, always fascinating and always competitive, as you said final few minutes we have left how about some fun questions where did the mayor of hinchtown come from that's a great question mayor of hinchtown came from uh, a case of beer in a basement of an office in ludington michigan uh, it was it was really just an idea of how to make a website stand out a little bit more you know back then Drivers were kind of just getting websites. The internet was still relatively new. Social media didn't exist. And every driver's website was pretty boring because they were all the same. And the group I was working with at the time, we wanted to do something a little bit different that would stand out. And this idea of making this sort of fictional internet town uh, and me, the self-proclaimed mayor of it, came up. And we decided (laughs) to run with it. And it took a second to catch on, but once it did, I mean, people sort of gravitated towards it. And now, you know, I'm the honorary mayor of like four different towns and, you know, people introduce me as the mayor of Hinchtown more often than James Hinchcliffe. So I guess it worked. (laughs) That's great. All right. With a one word answer, describe the following people. Connor Daly. Energetic. Okay. Alexander Rossi. Calculated. Becky Hinchcliffe. Amazing. <laughs> Paul Tracy. Uh, the right word for Paul is, I mean, it's, it's, I'm trying to, there's like a two word one. I, I mean, I'll go with this. It's, it's, Paul is very strong willed, okay. stubborn. I mean, maybe you could call him stubborn, St- but stubborn. in a positive way. In a positive way. Old school question modified a bit. If you could be a car, what would you be? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, man. I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a, ooh. Stumped Hinch. Yeah, you did. Yeah, the guy who talks for a living is speechless. This this isn't even urinal etiquette yet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh that's a tough one you know like I've, I've got some i've got some british you know lineage my dad was from england and i've always had a, a passion for kind of vintage british cars um you know whether it's like a lotus 7 or an e-type jag or something like that uh probably something in that vein wonderful if you could have dinner with any three racers from the past or present who are they and why well, Greg, for sure, um, just because he was my hero and uh, I've gotten to know him in a way through all these people that used to race against him, right? I've become friends with his friends and I hear all these stories and uh, I would just would love to have got to know him and got to race against him. Uh, so Greg, for sure. Uh, I think if you ask that to a lot of people in this sport, a popular answer would be um, Ayrton Senna. Uh, so I would, I would love to have dinner with him, pick his brain, learn about him, learn about the man, the myth, the legend. And then I, so follow-up question, can it not be someone that you have already had dinner with? It can be whoever you want. Yes. Cause if, if you're allowed to, if it's allowed to be someone you have had dinner with, I've had the fortune of, you know, getting to know Mario Andretti over the years, uh, being associated with the team and man, you, you're not going to find a more fascinating guy to have, uh, you know, a dinner and a bottle of wine with 
the stories he has memory like a steel trap it's unbelievable the details of races from back in 1971 that he remembers it's just wild and uh and i think that'd be that'd be a fun dinner party excellent is there anything that you would not race uh on bikes motorcycles okay. two wheels anything two wheels too dangerous anything two wheels too dangerous. Those guys, I, I, it's so funny. They think we're crazy. I think they're crazy. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's weird how we both rationalize our own disciplines while simultaneously thinking the other one's nuts, but, uh, no, yeah, I'm two wheels is too brave for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lightning round now, New York or Toronto, Toronto, hockey or baseball, hockey, IndyCar or F1. IndyCar. Mac and cheese or poutine? Mac and cheese. Hmm. Dunkin' Donuts. My first non-Canadian answer. <laughs> uh, right. You were, you were on a roll there. Dunkin' Donuts yeah. or Tim Hortons? Timmy's. <laughs> of course. Final thing. This month, you and your former teammate, Ryan Hunter Ray, were inducted into the Long Beach Motorsports Walk of Fame. Well, I know Long Beach holds a lot of special memories for you. You won there in 2017 as well as 2009. You joke that they thought you thought they emailed the wrong person about being inducted. It had to be special though for you. It was honestly. I mean, it's um, what a humbling thing to be a part of. You know, the the walk started in two thousand six or two thousand seven, I think, in Long Beach. And when you look at the list of names that are on it, incredible! It's crazy. It's crazy to to think that my name would be in that group uh, and you know, it does make you feel old, you know, when you start getting inducted into things, it's, that's a, it's a true sign of your age. Uh, luckily Hunter Ray is like way, way older than I am. So that made <laughs> me feel a little better. Um, but, uh, but no, honestly, they, like you say, that place is so special. I think for a lot of drivers, that's kind of number two after the 500 in terms of races that you want to win and the prestige of the event. And I had a lot of great races there over my junior career, over my IndyCar career, you know, other podiums, top fives win. And, uh, and so to be recognized anywhere is obviously a, a huge honor, but for it to be in that particular spot was, was extra special. Who wins the Indy 500 Hinch? Scott Dixon. Okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> Loved having you on the program. Great to share a Sirius XM microphone with a fellow Sirius XM host. You've done a wonderful job representing the country of Canada. And uh, thank, thank you so you. much for being on the program. No, real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks again to my guest today, James Hinchcliffe. And to see my interview with James, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see nearly 100 interviews. And thanks for listening to Cars and Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as on Instagram at Cars and Culture SXM and on Twitter at Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. We'll see you down the road.